hello, hello, hello. Today we are talking about the essential and not so essential equipment that you need to get going in our hobby of miniature painting. I'm Khan and you are watching The Wrath of Minis. These are the essentials. When it comes to painting miniatures, pretty much the first place that we are gonna start is, well, paint. Because you can't paint a model without paint, obviously, right? And paint is a complex subject. In our miniature realm, most people utilize acrylic. Acrylic partly because it's got a good adhesiveness to the things that we're painting, it dries very quickly, it's forgiving, and it's not too expensive. But because there are a different companies making this stuff, there are different ranges of it from like craft paints to professional paints, buying a set of paints is a little tricky because A, you can spend a lot of money very fast. Um, it's probably one of the more expensive parts of our hobby besides the miniatures themselves. And so I'm gonna have a link in the description about what I think are just good paints to get going that can help you start it. A, if you've just never started before, and you're just contemplating about getting in, or if you already know that you like the hobby and you're looking for a good sort of starter set, I've also got that covered as well. Vallejo game color or fantasy color are great places to start for not too much money. You can go on Amazon, you can get them for sub $40 and they give you a good enough range to get a sense of what you can are capable or what you can do. And they have like a bit of metallics in there. They got some skin tones and some various other colors. And Vallejo is a very good company and it's got a uh, high pigment quality to it. So it's much closer or much more akin to some of the top lines of stuff that are out there. If you're already in the hobby and you're looking for a paint line to take you further a little bit, then something like Monument Pro Acrylic Line is a great place to get going. There's a much larger range of stuff out there. They come in slightly bigger bottles. The tops are reasonably good and they have like little agitator balls in them, so they're great for mixing. Um, that's a good company to go for. However, with, with that being said, we are always kind of looking to try new things out. There's a whole skew of different kinds of paints. A, you could be utilizing oil paints that are out there. There's also pigment paints, there's ink paints, there's enamel paints, and there's sort of specialty stuff out there like that does crackle or it does like rust various kind of things like that. And all of that stuff is pretty cool, but it's also worth building up your base first, getting comfortable with just your regular line. And then if you feel like you want to expand, well, there is a lot to, you know, a lot to choose from. And that's really up to you about what you, where you want to go. And so, especially if you're a beginner, I kind of recommend practicing as much as you can with the paints that you've got, because, Mixing colors is part of play when it comes to painting stuff. And so if you've got a wet palette, mix stuff, try things out, learn to understand that paint that you've got before necessarily branching out and trying a whole bunch of other things. I kind of think that it's better to buy good quality paints rather than buying like low craft paints and then seeing what you think about it because Part of it is like coverage and how easy it is to apply paints, how well they mix. But again, that's all complicated stuff. And it's also a matter about like, what's the medium that holds acrylic. So understanding acrylic paint is like, here's pigment and here's the medium and how those are sort of mixed together. And there are different types of mediums that hold it all. So yeah, it's a big subject and there's lots of information to learn to truly understand what or how acrylic paint best work. So I'm actually going to be designating an entire video specifically to sort of uncovering the mysteries of paint. And hopefully that will give you an insight about what and why and then when and how to use certain things and why like this thing does this thing and why this thing does this other thing. Once we've completed with paint, obviously you're going to need some paint brushes in order to apply that paint unless you want to get finger painting on it. And I'll tell you that's a bit of a messy job. There are lots of paint brushes out there ranging in a whole variety of prices. 
I think if you're just starting out, it is probably worthwhile going for synthetic brushes. Stuff like this. There are pros and cons practically for every kind of brush, at least in terms of its construction. Um, but if you are starting out, it's a great place to start, partly because they're so sort of affordable. And if you mess them up, that's okay. You know, you can always just buy a bunch more. Even if you buy a bunch of synthetic brushes, it's still worth buying one or two uh, Kalinsky Sable brushes as well. Um, these are pretty much what like the pros use. Um, there's a whole variety of brands out there, but they will use something of this nature. And a Kalinsky is effectively just the the tail hair of a squirrel that's like up in like Siberia territory. And they have a kind of a property which synthetic brushes just don't really quite do. Now the problem with them though, is that they are quite expensive. You're looking at spending probably a minimum of 10, but probably 50, could it be up to $15 per brush? And that's obviously can get pretty expensive pretty quickly because a lot of people will have different ranges of paintbrushes. So when it comes to miniature painting, a lot of people will use a size one. That's probably the most classic size brush that miniature painters are gonna utilize. However, we also deal with like zeros or double zeros, even occasionally triple zeros for the very, very tiny things. And of course we work in like twos or threes and fours, depending on how large the model that we're working. So, but we're working in a pretty tight range. Besides just like your regular brushes that you would utilize for most miniatures, there are specialty brushes as well that exist. Um, you will find dry brushes and dry brushes could be any brush, but the ones that I tend to find that are the best or the ones that you have that can have the most control are actually the ones like this that are a bit like makeup brushes. Now you can buy them cheap as if you can get makeup brushes that are very small, but you can also spend a bit of money as well and get like something like the Artist Opus ones and they do a range of them. And I find that these are probably my favorite types of dry brushes. And of course there are also other like strangely shaped brushes um, that you can get that you'd find more classic to like regular painting. But these work really well when you're painting much larger scale stuff. So if you're painting a lot of terrain, you don't want to be using your very precise paint brushes. You wanna be using big fat brushes that you can like cover a lot of paint quickly. So there are a variety of things out there, um, but at starter point, if you're not doing even terrain or anything like that, it would be to get a few good, like get a, a bunch of synthetic brushes of a, that range type, and then just a couple of Kalinsky Sable and test those out and see what you think about them. The one thing you will need besides brushes is absolutely, and I mean absolutely brush soap. You're going to need it. Um, in order to keep your brushes, your investment in reasonable condition, you need to utilize brush soap. And you need to use it all the time. It's great stuff, gets rid of all the paint, and it helps condition the bristles. Now, synthetics don't need to be conditioned, but you do need to clean them because otherwise they won't hold a tip at all. So even though we just talked about paints and um, paint brushes, we can't even really get there generally until we get to a point where we actually have assembled the miniatures. Plenty of games come pre-built and that's awesome and you don't have to do nearly as much work with it. But you know, stuff like Games Workshop, Kingdom Death, and various other things like the resin models and stuff like that, you're going to have to assemble every single thing to make it work. Not only that, you're also gonna to have to remove mold lines, sand stuff, uh, cut things, mess with the model. There's nothing worse sort of when you're painting a model that once you've painted it, you realize that underneath that paint that you've just applied, you can see mold lines, gaps in your models and things that are part of the actual miniature itself. And so it's up to us to, to prep our work as best as possible before painting, priming, and all that stuff to get into that finished product. So these are the tools that I think are the most essential in order to get you going there. So obviously you're gonna need a pair of clippers. You gotta cut them off the sprue. You need that. I like to have a X-Acto blade knife type thing. You need one of these, a hobby knife, something sharp. You could buy like a packet of these things in like a hundred. This is a great tool, partly because 
it can be used as a means of cutting or even scraping off the mold lines, but it also being able to cut off anything particularly large. You also want this blade to be super sharp. So if you find that it's getting dull, swap out the blade. Though knives are sharp and you need to be very, very careful with them, if you have to apply a lot of force, that is the likely, that is the moment that you're most likely going to hurt yourself. So just be careful with a hobby knife. Also, another thing is a sanding stick, something that is bendable, flexible, is a great tool. Because we're dealing with models that have a lot of curvature and things of that nature, um, if we use a hard file, it means pretty much that we're going to force the model to conform to the tool that we are using. And a lot of the time we don't want to do that. We want to remove the mold line or piece of plastic or something that we don't want to have, but we want to keep the contour that exists. So something that flexes, I think is a better place to be than say a hard tool. Hard tools can be useful if you're doing more conversions and cuttings and needing to file down like a large amount of material. Besides the sanding sticks though, sanding sponges. These are extra flexible, very small, and can be really like bent into place to get into sort of tight, hard locations. There are specific places that where a sanding stick will not get to, for instance, like maybe an armpit or underneath something where you're confined by space. And this, because it's squishy, you can flatten it. It's a great way of removing stuff, but keeping the detail and getting into hard to reach places. And as well as that, a sort of a pin vice kind of thing. This is, I don't use this very often. A lot of people who uh, paint Warhammer 40K say that you have to drill the gun barrels. Well, then you need one of these things to drill the gun barrel. But also this can be useful for pinning, which you don't necessarily need to do, but if you're dealing with really large models, things with big wings and stuff like that, and the contact points are limited in terms of the amount of space, pinning can be a very a great way of solidifying that joint. And you can use like, a, you know, like this little pin vise plus a, uh, like a paper clip works very well for making a very solid bond and location. So that's very useful. And besides that, you're gonna need some cement glue. This stuff is what you're predominantly going to be using for most miniatures. The only time that you will not be using this stuff will be when you're utilizing resin or metal. Now, the thing you gotta be careful with, with the cement glue is that it actually melts the plastic. And so when you, when you bond two different bits of plastic together, it actually will like literally physically join. And once you've got it in, it's very, very hard to separate the two. So I, you have to be pretty sure with it and you also need to make sure that you don't use too, too much. Cause if you can pour it at a place, it can actually melt plastic in places. Luckily, the tip is very small, meaning that you have great control with it, but you still need to be a little careful like anything in this hobby. Of course, if you are utilizing resin or you are using um, metal models, then you need to get down to super glue and you just need to have some of this stuff kicking about. Now, super glue is minorly problematic. Don't buy a big bottle of super glue and be like, oh, I'm gonna use this, it's gonna keep around for a long time. It doesn't work. For some reason, once you open up super glue to air, it changes over time and eventually it loses its, like, its, um, its strength over time. And so you actually just want a small little bit use it when you can. And then eventually when it's when you start to realize that it's no longer very functional, then you buy another small one or you have multiple little small ones and you utilize them in that way. Um, even this particular one, which I've got, and I have used some of it, is losing its, its, uh, its potency. So the smaller the better when it comes to super glues. A couple of other little key pieces that you may see other people have or you know a part of our hobby are going to be files stuff like this. And another thing you might see is also like little saws like this. These tools can be and are useful, but I find that they are more useful for when you are doing sort of kit bashing or when you're doing major, major cuts or incisions upon a miniature and you really want to change the, the shape or nature of what that miniature is that you perhaps are altering. Um, for most things, 
I will not use any of these tools when it comes to just sort of removing mold lines or taking a model off a sprue and then assembling it. This is not the type of tools that I use this for, but they can be useful if you're making major alterations to a model. Talking about major alterations to a model, when you're building them, there can be gaps and things like that, but not only just gaps, when we're changing things up, we may need to add stuff to the miniature to make sure that there, it, it looks proper and it doesn't look like it's just bits and pieces stuck together. And so this is where it comes into these parts here, different kind of compounds and epoxies that we would use to fill into the gaps and make a miniature our own. For the most part, when it comes to filling a gap, I will just use plastic putty. This stuff is just water soluble, so it's very straightforward, very simple. You don't need any special tools to make this work. And so for the most part, I would just recommend this. You don't need a big one either for it because most models are pretty good and you just don't need much. However, sometimes there are things you need to do, you need to put more effort in because the gaps are way larger than they should be, or you're trying to make some little changes to stuff. And the way you would do that would be using utilizing these two types of epoxy kind of mixes for those things. A very common thing will be green stuff. Green stuff comes in this kind of role, but you can also get green stuff where they're in like literally two different compounds uh, separated. So it'd be normally like a yellow and then the blue. And what you do is you cut a piece of it off, you uh, mix it together until it becomes green, yellow and blue, you know, adds, mix green. And then you get this very sticky um, material that's very flexible and it allows you to sort of change things and it allows you to sculpt stuff. Firstly, if you're gonna buy green stuff, don't buy it in this roll form, buy it in two separate containers and then apply and add them together. Okay, and partly there's, there's, there's complexity in this only in the sense of how much do you apply of each color. And that takes a little practice. I'm not gonna really get into that. I just want you to be aware that you, the different uh, mixtures or the amounts of it can change how flexible and malleable and your working times when it comes to utilizing green stuff. The reason why I recommend not buying a roll is that the yellow and the blue are touching currently in this situation. And what that means is that those two compounds have begun to already work together, causing them to be harder in the center. And you really don't want that. You, so when, if you do have a roll already, I would actually just leave the center alone and cut around it or cut that, cut that bit out when you're using it. And then you have two fresh bits being applied together. You will find people who are kit bashers or people who really want to alter their model that green stuff is a phenomenal tool to utilize. But I think at first it's not for most people. It's only if you really want to go into that world and start changing your model apart. Yeah. Another thing that people use is Milliput. Effectively, it's the same sort of principle as green stuff. You have two different types of epoxies. You cut them to the amount that you need. You blend them together, and it gives you sort of this working time. It's much less sticky than green stuff. Uh, it hardens to like a rock kind of surface, and it's much more sandable, if that makes any sense. Like green stuff, I find, is quite hard to um, not work with, it's very sticky and it allows you to make interesting things like beards or fur tufts and stuff like that. Whereas this I find is much better for filling in spaces or covering up certain parts and then allowing you to sand back down so you can get like a really nice smooth finish. But again, like though this is great stuff, I tend for just very early on and basic things, the plastic putty is a better place to go, water soluble and just easy to work and straight out of the bottle. So I was talking about paints, but another thing that I need to talk about with paints comes with primer. And primer is also obviously an extraordinarily important part of this hobby. Priming is us applying it onto the model before we apply our paint. It gives us a sort of layer that we are working off from. And when we prime something, it generally levels off a lot of the sort of micro details that might exist. And it also gives us a color generally black or white of some sort that we can work off from. Um, though these two colors here are neither black nor white, the two colors that I do recommend if you're going to get a sort of spray can version is black and also then white. And Games Workshop, I think, make the best ones of the lot that I have tried. I say that, 
However, I have stopped using spray cans. Now, spray cans really requires you to go outside, and in New York City, going outside is not exactly the easiest thing to do when it comes to priming. So for me, I use my airbrush and I use um, the sort of surface primer from Vallejo. I also use a white as well, so I can do a zenithal lighting when I choose to do so. Also, the nice thing with this stuff, or the airbrush stuff, is that you can actually hand paint it on if you need to do it, which you obviously cannot do with the uh, spray cans. So spray cans is probably where I would start, obviously, because in order to do this, you need an airbrush, and that's an expensive sort of thing that you don't necessarily know that you want to get into. And something like this will only cost you like 10 to $15 for a can. So that's the place to start, but it does mean you need to go outside to do it. Absolutely one of the most important pieces you really need is a cutting mat of some kind. These cutting mats are generally designed to be like self-healing, so you can cut into them without affecting anything. Also, besides just having a cutting surface, it's kind of just nice to have a mat of some sort. That, so if you're painting and there's like paint gets everywhere, it goes on the mat, not on your nice table. That's what you really want it for, just to stop messing everything else up in your household and just mess up the cutting mat. So having one of these is an important thing just to stop destroying other parts of the house. I'm sure, you know, anyone who lives with you will be greatly appreciative of you buying one of these things. The next thing you're gonna need is light. Light is super important. Everything that you're, you're, you're painting from is defined by the amount of light that you've got. So you really want to get as much light as possible. There's a whole bunch of things out there on the market, but you can pretty much do it from home without buying anything specifically, as long as you've got a strong light bulb. However, it, I also find it best if you've got, unless you've got a really big light bulb or a painting lamp specifically, then having two lights is also very useful, one on sort of each shoulder. So you're kind of removing the shadows of anything that you're holding. You can see everything and there's lots of light covering it. And you also want like a daylight light rather than say a warm light or anything like that. That will change how you are seeing those things. But yeah, it's a super vital thing. Generally, everyone has like a painting desk lamp of some kind. So next up, we have got holding models. Now, a lot of the time when we're painting something or a miniature, a miniature, we need to be able to hold it. And there are lots of different types of holders out there. So a very common one is the Games Workshop miniature holder. And it works quite well. This opens up here, the base fits in, and you've got something that you can hold turn around and paint that miniature. It's actually very good, I really like it. Um, there are a variety of other kinds out there and you do need something like this. You can't really hold the miniature in hand and paint it at the same time. And this gives you a good grip and allows you to stabilize the model that you are painting much better than if you were having it literally in your fingers. There are multiple ways about doing this without having to necessarily buy, say, something like this or even something like this. You could get, if you have wood lying around your house, which we all do, obviously, um, you can chop him up to be quite small, and then you could have that as a sort of a holder, and then you could apply the model onto it. And something like putty or like blue tack is a great thing to have around, actually. So this is just a useful thing to have, but you could then tack it on. Otherwise, you could buy something like a sort of fancy one like this, where you you know, again, apply a model into it and you can get different sizes of these sort of like metal bars, which are very useful for allowing you to stabilize and put the painting hand and hold hold on to something to stabilize the rest of your hand. So I actually really like this uh, type of holder, but there are a whole skew of them out there. They all serve roughly the same purpose. A lot of the time people are painting multiple models, uh, especially if it's like squad base or army base. And you can even use cork from like uh, wine and stuff like that, which I do plenty of times to hold a bunch of different parts of say a miniature that I'm working on. So there are cost effective ways like just drinking lots of wine. That sounds great to me. Or you could buy, you know, hobby holder stuff like this different companies have it, or you could chop down wood and have little blocks that you can hold and work that way. So a whole skew of different things that you can do to make that work. So you realize that you guys are getting into miniature painting and you already got some essentials, but you are looking to take it a step further. 
This stuff here are the things that you don't absolutely need, but can change your life in your in journey into miniature painting. Let's get to the most essential non-essential item here, and that's going to be the wet palette. You don't absolutely need a wet palette, but I think you do. You need a palette of some kind with acrylic paint. Acrylic paint is a very fast drying paint. Once it's exposed to air, boom, this thing will dry very quickly. And so it really limits your working time whilst painting. A wet palette increases that by, I don't even know, by orders of magnitude. And it gives you that working time that you need in order to apply your paint in a way that you do not feel rushed. It also allows you to do advanced techniques and it also allows you to give control to thinning your paints, which is extraordinarily important when it comes to painting minis. So uh, though a wet palette is not technically, I think it is an essential. And it's something that if you are very interested in this hobby, you should really very much look into it. There are a whole skew of different companies out there that make this thing. This one here is a red grass one, which is very good. But you can also make one yourself Making a wet palette is really a very, very straightforward thing. Normally it's a sponge of some kind. Then you place effectively a kind of parchment paper on the top of it and water underneath it. That's all you need to extend the life of your paint. Making one at home is pretty straightforward and I've done that myself. Weirdly enough, I've actually reverted back to using my red grass one, partly because the one that I had made, the lip was a bit too high and so I, I had occasionally like knock the edge of it and it would kind of tilt a little bit causing all the paint to shift. So if you can find a very flat kind of like enclosed surf, uh, case, you could create one yourself and it would be, you know, probably a fair bit cheaper. Probably one of the very first things you're gonna come across as a tool that you'd be interested in, but you don't know if you wanna plunge that direction is the compressor and an airbrush. A, you need both of them if you're gonna do this, and you can spend a bit of money in it. And so it can be a, that price can be a barrier to entry when it comes to this thing. How serious are you when it comes to miniature painting? That's a tough question. That's a tough question. The thing about it is that painting minis is not a quick thing. It takes time and effort. And if you're painting an army, for instance, you know it takes a while. Even painting 10, 10 troops can take you a bit of time. And the airbrush can really save a ton of time when it comes to painting. It also can allow you to do some pretty cool effects as well and can speed up your whole general workflow. You can do really cool blends with it. You can do zenithal highlighting. You can prime your models. You can even use the colors that you would paint on the model and spray through the airbrush directly onto it, allowing you to get, say, an army of 100 troops down and have them all on the color red pretty fast. Yes, it wouldn't be interesting yet because you have to add the detail to it, but it will allow you to really sort of move along very fast along in your painting. An airbrush is still a tool and it does come with its own sort of fair share of pitfalls, not pitfalls, more like complications. It takes a bit of work, it takes time getting used to it and practice, like, I guess, like anything. You're gonna need, not only gonna need a compressor and an airbrush, you're gonna need to get probably a little bit of airbrush thinner, which will help make the paint flow a little more easily and doesn't mean to help not clog up your airbrush because that just is annoying. And we all know it. We all know it is if you've got one. Pipettes are really useful. Partly, we are maybe making a concoction of paint, pulling that through, or using a dropper bottle of some kind, as well as getting some primer. So a great, great tool if you're interested in wanting to speed up. And I actually really can't stress enough how much faster your work can be with an airbrush, especially if you're painting large forces. I realized that you have all this equipment and these various things. You're gonna need organizers perhaps for your paint so you're easily accessible for you to uh, you know, pick from. And also having a designated workspace that you can like just get 
messy with and don't have to feel like it's like, oh, I have to keep it clean or that you've got to pull it out onto your sort of dining room table so you can paint for a little bit and then pack everything away. Sure, that's sort of like a real commitment to make a designated space, but it can really make a difference, you know, when everything is sort of set up for you, you just get to sit down, turn the light on and get going. Um, so if you find that you're really invested in this hobby, it's a, a nice thing to have is a designated space. And there's a bunch of other little things that I quite like, not absolutely essential, but nice to have and useful for a variety of different purposes. Thinning your paints, you can just do with water and that absolutely works for most applications. Sometimes, you know, having a little bit of airbrush uh, thinner is very nice for your airbrush, but having maybe like an acrylic retarder is something that I actually quite like. I don't, you, you use very little of this stuff, but it can really help the, the paint flow a little bit more easily, or it helps you create a glaze, which I find is very helpful. Another thing that's also nice to have is a varnish. Now, these, you know, models that we're painting, some of us make it for display, but some of us make it because we're playing a game. And if we're playing a game, then having a varnish of some kind, preferably a matter varnish rather than like a satin or gloss varnish, um, would be something that you'd utilize to cover the model to just make it a little tougher and more resilient. So if you know your greasy fingerprint, you know, just like moving a miniature around, will eventually uh, pull the acrylic off the model. And so if we want to protect that, a little bit of varnish is a very useful thing, especially in army painting and stuff like that, and you're moving lots of troops around. Varnish is very nice. A couple other things is like, well, what about, you know, you're painting stuff, but what about bases and things like that? Now, bases is a, is a sort of a deep topic because there's a lot that you can do with it. Firstly, you can make it like a little diorama with it. You could get little rocks, you could glue that down, you could build like something intricate, you know, and interesting. It depends on how much effort or what you want to put in to any given model. Now, when you're doing like a hundred models, whew, that would be brutal if you were to make like something unique for every single one of them. There are things out there that you can do. You could go to your local park, pick up, you know, literally gravel and stuff like that and use that, you know, like PVA glue, glue that onto your onto the base spray it over and then paint it to your color. You could do stuff like that. You can buy things like this, like this AK natural texture uh, earth, which pretty much you just add water to it, mix it to the consistency that you want and then apply it onto your miniature. But you can also go like way further than this. You can buy like diorama kind of stuff. You could buy leaves, you could buy tufts of grass, you can buy various like uh, filigree or like plant life material and create a base, a scenic base for you. And that's a bit, as you kind of venture into that territory, it gets more and more expensive because there are so many different types of plants out there and there are different companies making it. So you want something that could be a bit more universal, probably. Getting something that's like this, like a big tub of it is a better value, you don't want like these little pots that have just like kind of a bit of terrain stuff in it. But something like this at least gives you texture on the ground. Finding other things with like different size rocks and stuff like that could be great just to kind of creating a different feel for each thing that you're making. And another thing that is also quite cool, and this sort of is not necessary and I don't actually use it too, too often, um, is some eyewear. Looking at miniatures obviously is very small and not everyone can do that. And there's a lot of detail that we're trying to apply. And it can be very, very helpful to have a type of magnifying glass that allows you to see that miniature even closer than how we're currently or normally seeing it. Um, you want something like, I prefer something like this than say a, a light that has a magnifying glass in it. And I also, you want something like this where it sticks out away from where your eyes are. If my eyes would be here, my nose is here. You want a little space between this. You don't want it to be abutted to your eyes. And the reason why you want that is so that you can easily transition from something that, that's in your like focus 
and then move outside of that range where you can look at, say, your wet palette or other paints and things like that. Because if you look at everything that's magnified, you'd constantly have to do this, which would just get really annoying really fast. Everyone finds their own way in this hobby. And so I can't tell you absolutely everything that you need for you. We do things differently. We, tr we, we go down different journeys in different places and we find that something works for me and something doesn't work for you. And that's part of this journey that we all take when it comes to this hobby. Hopefully the stuff that I've just given you gives you a good sense of what is, is what you need to get going. This is a hobby that you grow into and you, if you don't fully know upfront what you're going for, go cheaper find it and learn to, you know, enter that that terror that realm. If you love it, sure, there are things out there and there are many ways to spend money, but you don't have to, you know? So get some things, experiment, mess it up, get it right, get it wrong, all that stuff, just do it. Get the essentials, work through it. You don't need to be constantly hunting Part of this of the journey that we are all doing is learning to utilize our tools and to do it as best or to use them as well as we can. Buying more paints, for instance, isn't gonna make you a better painter. Using the same paints and utilizing them in different ways might. Getting brushes that work that have better control, sure, but you still need to practice the brush control in order to best utilize them. Do you need an airbrush? Sure, you don't need to, but it could save you a lot of time and effort later, but still takes practice to utilize. You could buy, you know, the very best of things, but it won't get you going and painting. And the only cure to that is to literally sit down and paint and practice. If you guys like this video, please subscribe, like the video, leave a comment. If, you're, if I've missed something completely obvious in this process, please jot that down. Or maybe there's something that you think is an absolute essential and I don't utilize. And I'm like, oh, that'd be cool. Cause maybe there's, there's it's a journey and we're learning together in some way or another, you know? And we're all a little in different places on that journey. That's it, I think for me, um, until the next video.